Thank you for tuning in today and welcome back to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, Zain Raza. We're back from our summer break and would like to thank those people that donated to our cause. This summer, we reached millions of people with our videos. For example, every video that we publish reaches thousands, if not tens of thousands of views. We have 150,000 subscribers now. And despite that fact, only 533 people donate to us via standing order which means only 0.003% donate to us on a regular basis. If you would like to strengthen as well as protect independent journalism, journalism that is free from corporate and state interest and is free from any external influence, then please visit the links in the description of this video and find out how you can donate to our cause. We thank you for your generosity. Today I'll be talking to human rights lawyer and independent journalist Dimitri Rascaris. As a lawyer, he specializes in class actions, human rights, and international law. In 2020, he ran for the Green Party leadership in Canada, finishing second. Dimitri, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Zane. Always a pleasure. Let us begin with your current trip to South Lebanon. As far as I know, the situation there is quite tense, not only because of the ongoing daily exchanges of rockets between Hezbollah and Israel, but also due to the rising tensions between Iran and Israel, following the extrajudicial assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Haini by Israel on July 21st in Tehran. One day earlier, Israel also assassinated the top commander of Hezbollah, Fuad Shakur, in Beirut. Germany's leading primetime news outlet, the Tagesschau, reported on a daily basis on US efforts to achieve a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip, which, according to some experts, they claim would also prevent Iran from retaliating if successfully achieved. After Blinken visits to Israel, he declared that his visit had been positive and that Israel was open to a bridging proposal for a ceasefire and that it is now in Hamas's hands. Hamas in turn responded with the following statement, quote, the new proposal fulfills Netanyahu's conditions. He rejects a permanent ceasefire and a comprehensive withdrawal of soldiers from the Gaza Strip. Netanyahu is responsible for the fact that there is no agreement, unquote. The main point of contention between Israel and Hamas is the extent of Israeli withdrawal and its presence in the Gaza Strip. For example, Israel wants to retain control of the Philadelphia Corridor, which connects the Gaza Strip with Egypt, and which Israel claims is used to smuggle weapons and ammunition. Could you first talk about your observations, what you've seen in the Lebanon since you've been there, and then comment on the efforts made by the US to reach a ceasefire and why Hamas continues to unilaterally reject it? Well, the, 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 the combat here is fairly, it, I, I wouldn't say fairly, it's, in, it's extremely intense at the moment. It could seriously escalate, to be sure. Uh, but uh, there was an assassination of a uh, leader of uh, the Palestinian movement in uh, Saida yesterday uh, by a drone strike. Uh, there were six Hezbollah soldiers who were killed uh, in the last 48 hours, I believe, perhaps seven or eight. Uh, there have been casualties on the Israeli side, although the Israelis are not opaque about it. Hezbollah announces, you know, with detailed information, every uh, one of its soldiers who was killed. Israel tends to be more uh, secretive about these sorts of things. But in any event, I have heard uh, dozens of explosions in the time that I've been here in the South. I've been here now for uh, 24 hours. I mean, over lunch today, we were seated on a terrace. Uh, we could see two Israeli military bases in the distance, uh, Metula and uh, Almanada. And um, uh, we heard at least uh, 10 explosions, possibly 15 explosions, and they seem to be coming from uh, Northern Israel. So, uh, and we saw videos later on of uh, Hezbollah rockets being fired near, uh, in the area of Arnun, which is uh, bordering on Israel. Uh, so uh, there's constant combat going on. Um, again, it could be seriously escalated at any moment. And in fact, the Chinese government, uh, five hours ago after the assassination of this Fatah leader in Saida, uh, urged all of its citizens to leave Lebanon immediately. And the Chinese government is not prone to do these sorts of things for political reasons. Uh, so um, uh, we're kind of you know playing it by ear. We don't know how much longer we can stay down here. Uh, this escalation that... Uh, has been promised by Iran and by uh, Hezbollah for the two uh, assassinations you mentioned could start at any moment. And once that uh, happens, so sort of all bets are off of where, where this war is going to go. In terms of the negotiations uh, with uh, uh, between the so-called negotiations between Hamas and uh, Israel, 
Uh, let me say, first of all, that everybody I speak to down here in Lebanon is, uh, whether or not they're supporters of the Islamic resistance, are very cynical about these negotiations. I don't think anybody actually believes in this country, as far as I can tell, that these negotiations are seriously designed to result in a deal. Uh, they believe that they're theater. And you mentioned uh, the sticking points in the negotiations. Let's be very clear that because uh, and, and, and no, we, we need only look as far as the recent decision of the International Court of Justice about the occupation. The ICJ has recognized that uh, Gaza is occupied territory. It's Gaza, uh, Palestinian occupied territory and that the occupation is illegal. It is illegal, meaning that Israel has no right whatsoever to have its forces stationed any longer on any part of the Gaza Strip, whether it be the Philadelphia corridor and the Neretzim corridor, which they've set up to divide the Gaza concentration camp into two parts, uh, they have to withdraw. That's their obligation. So they're basically demanding things that are illegal. And Hamas is perfectly within its rights. Any Palestinian representative is perfectly within its rights to say, you must vacate your forces entirely from the Gaza Strip. And unless Israel is doing that, uh, it cannot be deemed to be a serious negotiating partner. But wasn't that ruling more focused on the West Bank um, or was it uh, centered around the land of Palestine? Because I could just imagine that the argument would be that uh, that ruling does not apply to Gaza because there are terrorists present there in Hamas and that they pose an existential threat to the existence of Israel. How would you counter that? Well, the, the, the ICJ has clearly said that, that Gaza is occupied territory. It's not just uh, the West Bank. The decision was not limited to the West Bank. It was uh, looked at broadly, the occupation, and Gaza is part of the occupation. You know, and if you're going to call Hamas a terrorist organization, how can you not call Israel a terrorist entity, which has killed over 16,000 Palestinian children in the last 11 months? And it could be in excess of 20 or 30,000 children, according to the Lancet, perhaps even over 50 or 60,000 children. Israel alleges that Hamas killed, Palestinian militants killed 36 children on October 7th. A minute fraction, of course, every child's life is precious, but the number of child casualties and civilian casualties on the Israeli side are a fraction of those on the Palestinian side. This has always been true, uh, Zain, year after year for the entirety of the 55-year-plus occupation. So to say that Hamas is a terrorist organization and that Israel is defending itself is to stand reality on its head and to make a mockery of the facts. Let's be serious here. So, And, and let's also recognize that the ultimate cause of violence on the Palestinian side is their oppression and their dispossession. That's what's causing this violence. The way to end it all, the violence on both sides, is to give the Palestinian people their right of self-determination. You are in South Lebanon right now and Hezbollah is president, uh, president at that place. I would like to find out how the perception of Hezbollah is there in Lebanon. Because the mainstream media here in Germany says they are an organization that is hell-bent on destroying the state of Israel, that they're anti-Semitic, they want to annihilate all the Jews. Um, rarely, if at all, do Western journalists travel there, speak with uh, Hezbollah commanders or high officials. But you have made that effort. So can you talk about what Hezbollah actually is and what they are after? Well, he Hezbollah, I actually interviewed the uh, international relations director of Hezbollah several months ago in Beirut. And I asked him this very question. And he said to me that, that Hezbollah welcomes the presence of the Jewish people in the region uh, and has absolutely nothing uh, against the Jewish people and has tremendous respect for the Jewish faith and the history of the Jewish people. Their complaint is not with the Jewish people, their complaint is with Zionism, and in particular with the oppression of Palestinians and the aggressions against Lebanon. And there have been enormous aggressions against Lebanon. Israel occupied Lebanon for well over a decade, and then it invaded again Lebanon again in 2006. In this current round of conflict, according to Western media sources, the civilian casualties on the Lebanese side are far higher than they are on the Israeli side as a result of Hezbollah attacks. So again, who is the aggressor? Who is the terrorist? Who is the oppressor? The evidence leads inexorably to one conclusion, and it is Israel. Hezbollah said very clearly that if the ceasefire is enacted in Gaza and uh, on terms that the Palestinian representatives can accept, it will stop attacking Israel. 
has been very clear about that. The simple solution here is for the Biden administration to stop funneling these weapons to what is a genocidal regime. And the war with Hezbollah would come to a swift end. I would like to ask you a personal question. You're from Canada, you're a family man, and yet you continue to visit dangerous places like the southern of Lebanon, where a war can break out at any second. And it's a time where Western countries are asking their citizens to evacuate and return home because the threat of an all-out war looms. Um, and you could get essentially stuck there. So what are your underlying motivations to report from this, these places? Are you not afraid of your life and well-being? Well, first of all, let me be very clear because uh, people who don't uh, like the perspective that I uh, have consistently expressed on this conflict will often say things like, well, he's being paid by somebody. I mean, I'm not being paid by anybody, okay? I'm not even having my, uh, my travel expenses reimbursed to me in whole or in part. Uh, and I do journalism as a public service. Uh, I have been fortunate to make a good living from the practice of law, which was my main career for over 30 years. I do this now because I have been very fortunate uh, I'm in a position to come to a country like this. Of course, I don't want to die. Uh, I'm well cognizant of the risks. I would like to have a very long, healthy, and happy life. Uh, but I can say in good conscience that if something should take my life at this stage, uh, I would feel as though I had done it. I had uh, I had sacrificed uh, my whatever years are remaining to me uh, for, uh, for for reasons of conscience. Uh, I, if other people are in a position to do what I am, and most people aren't, I think it's incumbent upon them to contribute in any way can, that they can. Uh, and uh, ultimately, um, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm fortified in my strong conviction that this is the right thing to do. I would like to shift gears here and focus on the latest developments surrounding the Nord Stream pipeline bombing, which took place in September 2022. On August 14, major headlines made the rounds in Germany that had issued arrest warrants in connection with the Nord Stream pipeline bombing. A Ukraine driver instructor named Volodymyr Z and two accomplices are accused of blowing up the pipelines. Both the German media and the state public prosecutor's office are sticking to the Andromeda yacht theory, claiming that there's clear evidence from former intelligence services as well as photographic evidence. According to their reports, this included a photo of a white van believed to have been used to transport di diving materials taken by traffic cameras on the island of Rügen in September 2022 with a passenger who, quote, strongly resembles Z, unquote. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has vehemently denied that the state played any role, while some German media have even spread the narrative that just because these men were from Ukraine does not necessarily mean they were hired by the Ukrainian government. This theory, of course, refutes Seema Hirsch's claim that the U.S., under the orders of President Biden, carried out a secret CIA operation to, to destroy the pipelines. Can you provide your assessment in light of these developments? Well, let's uh, first of all uh, start with the reality that uh, in the non-Western world, this theory is being met with howls of laughter, and rightly so. Uh, first of all, it's a very convenient story. It basically exonerates anybody who's in a position of authority in a Western government of any responsibility whatsoever, and the Ukrainian government as well. How convenient that is. Uh, the people who are uh, alleged to be the perpetrators, nobody knows who they are. How convenient that is. It said that Zelensky didn't have any knowledge of this. Wow, what a wonderful outcome that is for the project of uh, U.S. hegemony. Uh, and these people are alleged to have had the ability to do something which was, from a technical perspective, extraordinarily difficult, even though there's no reason to believe that they had either the equipment or the expertise to pull it off. And the last thing I want to say about this preposterous theory, uh, Zane, is that uh, if, in fact, uh, these people, whether or not it's true, uh, let's assume for the sake of argument is true. Why would the German government continue to hand over weapons to the Ukrainian government if they aren't prepared to hand over the criminals, the alleged criminals? Uh, it sounds to me that based on this story, these people are in the jurisdiction of Ukraine. So they should be arrested and they should be extradited to Germany. It's the least that the Ukrainian government can do. Uh, and there was also some indication that they were in Poland. Well, again, the same uh, issue arises. Poland is an ally of Germany. They're both in NATO. They're both on the same side in this war in Ukraine. Why won't the Polish hand over the accused persons to stand trial in Germany? I, I assure you that they will never, I mean, look, I can't be say, I can't say this with 100% certainty, but I'm highly confident that these people will never stand trial in Germany. And that will tell you a lot. If they never are brought to justice and all this remains is unproven and untested allegations, no court of law has ever given the opportunity to address them. 
then we should uh, ultimately uh, take the much more credible account offered by Seymour Hirsch, a legendary journalist with inside sources about what really happened here and what really happened here in all likelihood as the U.S. government committed an act of terrorism against its allied Germany. Let us now focus on the war in Ukraine. I would like to first recap some of the major developments of this year for our viewers. In spring of this year, the United States approved a $61 billion military aid package for Ukraine that also included for the first time the 300km range Army Tactical Missile Systems, also known as Attack ms The Russian military then began its summer offensive in eastern Ukraine, making notable territorial gains. In its response, the West gave Ukraine not only further arms, but also gave it permission to deploy Western-made weapons to strike targets within Russian territory that Russia may be using to support its offensive. In June, peace proposals were put forward both by Russia and Ukraine. However, they failed to make any headway. In a surprising turn of events, Ukraine launched an incursion into Russia's Kursk Oblast region beginning August, and according to the German media, it has made notable progress by taking hold of 1,250 square kilometers of territory that includes 90 localities. In addition, Ukraine has also captured thousands of Russian soldiers, which its states will give it leverage over the Kremlin should negotiation take place. According to President Zelensky, Ukraine's primary goal of this incursion was to weaken Russian defense lines in eastern Ukraine by forcing them to retreat and refocus their position on defending Russian territory. It has also been reported that German tanks and vehicles responded in this incursion, which according to the German government as well as the experts appealing to the German media claim it's permissible under international law. Previously, Germany was quite hesitant for its weapons to be used in any offensive means in order to avoid a continental war with Russia. How do you assess the surprise incursion in Russia? Has Ukraine now gained the upper hand in this war? Well, I think we can only answer that question by looking at the whole battlefield. And uh, what is happening in uh, the Donbass is incredibly uh, important and vastly more important than what's happening in Kursk for the simple reason that Kursk is of no real strategic value. There are a bunch of little villages there, uh, a lot of forests, it's very bucolic. Uh, the only thing that potentially has strategic value is a nuclear power plant, which is beyond the reach of the Ukrainian forces at this time and is very unlikely to be conquered by them. Um, so what they basically have a, a, acquired, if you believe the accounts that are coming from the Western media, and one should take those with a substantial grain of salt, is uh, sparsely populated land containing no infrastructure of strategic value. Uh, meanwhile, what's happening in the Donbass is that uh, the Russian forces have been advancing in ever increasing increments. Uh, now it's kilometers a day uh, towards uh, the outer edge of the, of the Donetsk region. They are now on the verge of taking a strategically important uh, town or city by the name of Pokrovsk. Uh, and uh, that is a linchpin in the defense system in the Donbass. Uh, they have already taken Avdivka. They've taken the outlying communities beyond Avdivka, which is uh, a sub suburb of uh, Donetsk City, one of the largest cities in Ukraine. And if they take Pokrovsk, uh, very likely there is going to be a collapse of the defense system. At that stage, all that's going to really remain uh, that would pose any kind of a challenge are the uh, towns of Kramatorsk and Slavyansk, uh, the last uh, foothold that Ukraine would have in the Donetsk region. In addition, you have advances being made uh, in the Kupiansk direction, where the, the Russian forces are moving steadily towards the Oskol River. And in all of this, the Ukrainians are suffering gigantic casualties. And, you know, in the Kursk region alone, you can see video after video after video of this vaunted NATO equipment burning uh, in the fields, on the roads, in the forests. Uh, there have been, uh, there's video evidence that the, it, the Russians have destroyed the most advanced uh, air defense systems in the possession of the Ukrainian military, uh, dozens and dozens of armored vehicles, including these uh, much ballyhooed Western tanks. Uh, they have destroyed HIMARS systems. Uh, they have taken out thousands and thousands of soldiers killed and wounded. This idea that the uh, Ukrainians have captured thousands of soldiers, which I think what the phrase that you used saying, I've seen absolutely no evidence to back that up. I've seen videos of a few dozen Russian soldiers. And if they captured thousands, how many more were actually in that theater of battle? That would have meant that the Russians had quite a large force in that theater of battle. Would the Ukrainians have been able to advance that quickly kil kilometers into the territory of Russia if there were many thousands of soldiers manning that border? The reason why the Russians, I think it's fair to say, uh, did not have a very large contingent 
of soldiers on that particular border is because they really didn't see a reason why Ukraine would want to commit large forces to attacking that area, because there are no assets of strategic value beyond, as I mentioned, the nuclear power plant, which is of no uh, it, it, realistically beyond the, the, the reach of the Ukrainian forces. This could ultimately, as people in the Western media, some commentators have uh, noted, expedite is uh, I'm sorry, Ukraine's defeat, uh, because Ukraine has had to cobble together these brigades from uh, already depleted brigades, which were defending the positions of the Ukrainian military in uh, the, in the Donetsk region, in Zaporozhye region, in Kupiansk. Uh, so uh, if this does not succeed, if the Ukrainians do not hold this territory, and that's really going to be the acid test, uh, you know, temporarily occupying it for a position of the, uh, for a period of a few weeks or months is uh, counterproductive if you end up losing the territory and sacrificing thousands of soldiers in the process. So before people begin celebrating on the Ukrainian side, let's see how long they hold this territory and let's see whether they're able to hold the defenses in the Donbass. Uh, I think the answer to that, sadly, for the Ukrainian people is going to be a resounding no. I would like to look at the broader geopolitical picture before ending this interview. For the first time since the end of the Cold War, the US will deploy long-range Tomahawk missiles in Germany by 2026. The Tomahawk cruise missile is not only hard to detect on radar, but also has a range of 2,500 kilometers. Moscow, for example, is around 1,600 kilometers away from Berlin. And this deployment will give NATO the capability to strike Moscow. Even though there wasn't a major political debate in Germany on this issue, most of the establishment parties such as the Greens, Social Democrats, Conservative, Christian Democrats all voiced their support for this deployment. German Foreign Minister Annalia Baerbock defended the deployment by stating that Russia has been continuously violating international arms agreement by expanding its nuclear capabilities. She went on and let me quote her here, We must protect ourselves and our Baltic partners against this including through increased deterrence and additional standoff weapons. Anything else would not only be irresponsible, but also naive in the face of an ice-cold Kremlin." I'll unquote. Can you provide your assessment on these long-range missiles and whether you think the deployment in Germany, as a foreign minister stated, will protect Europe and provide deterrence against the ice-cold Kremlin? I think Petra Kelly is turning over in her grave, saying, Petra Kelly, the founder of the German Green Party, which uh, we emerged from the anti-nuclear movement, which was adamantly opposed in its very genetic makeup to the stationing of nuclear-capable American missiles on German soil. This is an utter betrayal of that legacy. And I say this not only as an activist, a peace activist, a journalist, uh, a person uh, who aspires to be a person of conscience, but also as somebody who ran to be the leader of the Green Party of Canada. Uh, you know, and I came very close to winning that contest in 2020. So I'm intimately familiar with the core values of the Green Party and the history of the party. And uh, I think the greatest favor that uh, Annalena Baerbach and Robert Habeck can do uh, for the global green movement is to change the name of their party. And they should call it the party of war and the party of reckless endangerment. Uh, here's the deal. Uh, if the Russians were actually concerned or inclined to use nuclear weapons, against the West, they would have used them by now. There are now German tanks and British tanks on Russian soil in areas where Germans under the Third Reich used tanks to kill massive numbers of Russians in the Second World War. And yet they haven't struck Germany, even with conventional weapons, let alone with nuclear weapons. So this notion that Putin's government or any Russian government is hell bent on waging nuclear war against the West is complete fantasy, it's delusional, and uh, frankly, they better come to their senses uh, before we are all uh, consumed in a conflagration of fire. And I just want to draw, uh, you know, remind people, I'm sure people in Germany are, are, are better aware of this than I am. But I learned the other day that uh, I'm going to mispronounce her name, uh, although I have great respect for her, Sarah Wagenrecht. Uh, I, I probably mispronounced that. The leader of a new uh, left-leaning anti-imperialist party in Germany gave a speech to the Bundeswehr, Bundeswehr I, I discovered this a couple of days ago, uh, in March of this year, in which she denounced the insane policies of the German government, the coalition government, in the Ukraine war, and concluded her impassioned statement with the words, have you all lost your minds? Uh, I repeat those uh, compelling words. And the question she asked on that day, six months ago, it's even more compelling today. 
Deputy Riscaris, journalist and lawyer for international law. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Zane. Always a pleasure. And thank you for tuning in today. Please don't forget to join our alternative media channels to YouTube, which is owned by Google. Our alternative channels include Telegram, Rumble, and a podcast called Podbean. You will find the links to all of these platforms in the description of this video. YouTube, which is owned by Google, can shadow ban and censor us at any time, especially in times of crisis when we are reporting on a perspective that is missing in the mainstream media. I thank you for tuning in today. I'm your host, San Raza, and see you next time.